Good morning. I'm happy to be back again this week to share God's word with you. I hope you've had a good week abiding in the shelter of God's presence. The last Sunday, I shared about living in the gospel. Uh, this morning, I want to speak to you about living out uh, the gospel. Uh, when I spoke about living in the gospel in specific, I spoke about two main things that we would take time and make effort to understand the concepts of the truths of the gospel. And as we do that, we position ourselves in a place where the concepts of the gospel will then become convictions of the gospel as we take time to meditate and absorb the truths of the content of the message of the gospel. And uh, as we do that, we will become majestic trees uh, rooted deeply in God's word, deeply in the gospel, and our lives will be fruitful for the glory of God. Uh, right now, I want to be sharing with you about living out the gospel. And what I mean by that is that as we looked at concepts becoming convictions, deep, authentic, powerful convictions, you know, cause us to make visible, to bring out what God has been doing in our lives. And so there is a transformation in our character of who we are and our conduct of how we live our lives. And so that's what the gospel does. The gospel transforms our life. It doesn't just, it doesn't make us, it doesn't modify us. It just doesn't paint us white from the outside. The gospel gives us new life. We are born again. We receive a new birth. And even as that happens, there's a continual transformation that happens. And that will climax till we see the Lord, either by his appearing first or if we go to be with him. Let's look at this further. You know, you and I understand that believing in the gospel opens the floodgates of God's mercy and grace. And in his mercy, God did not give us what we deserve. But in his boundless grace, he poured upon us all that we could never earn for ourselves. Now, many of us understand that. But also, I think many of us just look at grace only as exemption. I've been forgiven of my sin. I've been delivered from, uh, from addictions. I've been delivered from things that are not of God. And uh, we, we're happy with that understanding. And as much as that is true, but just, just the part of it, because grace is, is exemption, but even further and even more, it is empowerment. It is divine, divine enablement. That is God's power made available to us, God's power effectually working in us, that we would live a God-word, God-glorifying life. And I want us to uh, look at a scripture closely that I believe will really help us understand how the grace of God that comes in and through the gospel into our lives, how it effectually works in us and through us for his glory. And this is a loaded passage in scripture. It is the Apostle Paul writing to his son, Titus, his spiritual son, Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 to verse 14. And follow me. I hope you open your Bible and follow me as we read this word by word, uh, verse after verse. In verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. Now, this passage, as I mentioned, is loaded. But let's just try to break as much as we can in these few moments. 
Now, as I mentioned, this is not the common grace of God that has come, that is upon all of mankind. What I mean by common grace is that he makes the sun to shine on the righteous and the wicked, the rain to fall on the righteous and the wicked. That's God's common grace as we understand that in theology. But this is more than that. This is the unique, powerful grace of God that comes as a result of understanding and believing in the gospel because it says clearly here in verse 11, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation, not just sunshine and rain, but bringing salvation to all men. And furthermore, we see, the, we see how there is enablement, there's empowerment, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Beloved, that requires the grace of God. That requires the power of God working in us to do that. And furthermore, it says, and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age. That requires the grace of God continually working in us and empowering us to say no and to deny ungodliness and worldliness any place in our life, to shun those things, to abhor those things, but to move Godwards, living a life that is sensible, righteous, and godly in this present age. And it says that within us is this blessed hope raging within us for, for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Here again in verse 14, it mentions about how grace has exempted us. It says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Jesus, by sacrifice, has redeemed us from every lawless deed. But it doesn't end there. It says, and to purify for himself, ongoing, purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. That requires the grace of God. That requires the power of God. My brothers and sisters, it is, it, is, it is important that we take time to understand who God is, what he's done for us, what he's doing in us right now and in, in all of our lives here on earth, and what he will do either when uh, we go to him or when he appears in glory. And let's imagine over you and me and over our families who have believed in the Lord, this, this huge arc of his salvation over our lives, just this huge arc over us. And it began with a term that we, we understand is called justification. Justification. And in justification, Jesus saved us from the penalty of sin. And furthermore, now there is ongoing sanctification by way of which he is going to be delivering us from the power of sin. Then the climax is one day he will, he will, he will deliver us completely from the presence of sin. That is glorification. So our salvation began with justification. It is ongoing with sanctification. And one day it will climax with glorification. Saved us from the penalty of sin saving us now from the power of sin and will one day save us and deliver us completely forever from the presence of sin. That is the grace of God. But I want to come back to sanctification because that is what God is doing now in our lives. And I want us to look at what fuels that sanctification, what motivates us to, to, to pursue sanctification. But I want to say something further very quickly and that in between uh, this are many layers of what God has done and what God's doing in, in the overarching uh, work of his salvation, his beautiful work in our lives. So for example, there is regeneration. That is, I'm new in Christ Jesus uh, because Jesus died for me. There's verses for this and I, we can't look at it, but I will send you across the north so that you could have your references to look at. But there is regeneration. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm not modified uh, I'm not just whitewashed. No, I'm not. I am, I'm a new creation. I'm a new Shannon. And so are you. That's regeneration. There is, there is propitiation. That is, I'm approved. Uh, because Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. The holy righteous judgment of God that I deserved. And then there is adoption. I'm a beloved child of God. You're a beloved child of God. 
because Jesus was abandoned for me. And then there is redemption where I have been delivered because Jesus was raised up for me. And I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit because Jesus has given me his Holy Spirit to indwell me. And, and then there is perseverance. You, I don't have to fear that I will fail in this race of faith, but that I will make it through. I will, I will finish this race well because Jesus has got a hold of me. And, and so, beloved, with each of these things that I mentioned, there are so many more. There are verses that this is based on, on the word of God, on scriptures. This is not fantasy. This is not make-believe. These are truths that God has given us in the scripture. So, he, so we understand uh, who God is and what he's done for us, what he's doing and what he will do for us so that we find our peace, we find our joy and we find our hope in him and him alone. You know, beloved, like, let me just pick up one of these precious truths. A little about 27 years ago, um, when I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus, believing in the gospel, you know, one of the truths that really, you know, blessed me and changed my life and filled me with such joy was the truth of adoption. That God, the creator of the universe, is now my father. And I am his child because I've believed in the name of his son. I've believed in the work of his son on the cross for me. So beloved, as we understand these truths and we rehearse them to ourselves, it fills us with peace. It fills us with joy. That helps us triumph over trials and testings in our life. That helps us understand that we are complete in Christ Jesus. Now coming back to, to sanctification, I want to say this. As we, as we look at these truths, um, you know, there, there are things that God will do uh, without any part that we have to, if I'm using the word, play in, in it. For example, our glorification. You know, one day uh, Paul says that immortality will swallow up mortality. We will have, we will have glorified bodies. And, and God will do that completely for us when he appears in glory. You know, and there are things that he has already done for us. You know, his, his, his work on the cross. It is finished. But right now, is this very, very precious work that is happening in your life and in my life. And that is the work of sanctification. To make us sanct, to make us holy, to make us like him. And I want to take us to a scripture that helps us understand this. Uh, uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. Again, the Apostle Paul writing in verse 13, I'll take a part of it. It says, So then, my beloved... Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will, that is to desire, and to work for his good pleasure. Now, let's just understand this. You know, Paul the Apostle is charging us as disciples of Jesus, as Christians. He's saying, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Put a word to it. Or be in awe of God. Be in awe that God is at work in you. He's not deputed an angel, uh, uh, not any man, but he himself is at work in you. And so what he is working in you by his spirit and by his word, partner with him and work it out, being in awe of him. Be thankful to him. Be worshipful of him and work it out. But look at the order in which it is placed. And the order in which is placed, he says first, for God is at work in you both to will. That means God first puts in us the desire, the desire. And then he says, when he's put that desire, he then gives us the enablement to work out for his good pleasure, what he's doing in us. Beloved, all that we do for God is because he has put in us first the desire to do it for his glory. And so to understand at the very core, the greatest evidence of your new life and my new life in Jesus is that he has put in us an insatiable hunger and thirst for him. This is the most precious gift and most precious work of God in our life. Let me try to put it in a statement. Can, 
connecting it to our sanctification. All life change or changing is a fruit of the supreme joy of us pursuing, finding, knowing, and enjoying God. He is our supreme joy, God himself. So remember, you know, how the psalmist wrote in Psalm 34 verse 8, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. In Psalm 37 verse 4, David wrote again, Delight yourself in the Lord. In Psalm 43 verse 4, the psalmist exclaims with unspeakable joy. He declares, he says, God, my exceeding joy. Beloved, what do these verses and so many more throughout the Bible help us understand? That the greatest supreme joy that you and I were created for was not something or somebody else. The greatest supreme joy that you and I were created for was God himself. The joy of knowing him. The joy of being loved by him or being known by him. And therefore, by that, loving him back, knowing him, serving him and obeying him. So, beloved, I don't see God merely for a better life, a better me, uh, you know, for a better marriage, better family, a better career. Uh, though all of those things are, are included in the grace of God and in his promises for our life. But, but they are not the supreme reason why we, we, we are sanctified. The supreme reason why we are sanctified is because he is drawing us to himself so that we can enjoy him to the fullest. And in that, us enjoying him, us pursuing him, us loving him, us obeying him, God is glorified. You know, this word that I mentioned earlier, this, this hunger and thirst for God. You know, in Psalm 63, verse, you know, verses 1 to 3, you know, we have King David writing about it. And he says, um, God I thirst for you. I thirst for you. Even my flesh yearns for you. Now I want to, I want to read a quote uh, from a commentary of Charles Spurgeon um, on this uh, verse, specifically on the word thirst. And I, I want to kind of bring this to a climax and you know bring an end to my message as I read this. Uh, Code of Charles Spurgeon, because we need to understand, beloved, that you and I were created for God and for Him alone, um, above everything else in our life. Thank God for His every precious blessing. But you and I were created to know God and to love Him, and in this is your and my supreme joy. But how God draws us into this journey of knowing Him and pursuing Him, by way of which we are sanctified, is that He puts in us. This deep, deep thirst for him. And so here's Spurgeon writing about thirst. Thirst is an insatiable longing after that which is one of the most essential supports of life. There is no reasoning with thirst, no forgetting it, no despising it, no overcoming it by stoical indifference. Thirst will be heard. The whole man must yield to its power. Even thus is it with that divine desire which the grace of God creates in regenerate men. Only God himself can satisfy the craving of a soul really aroused by the Holy Spirit. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is, a weary place and a weary heart make the presence of God the more desirable. If there be nothing below and nothing within to cheer, it is a thousand mercies that we may look up and find all we need in him. The absence of outward comforts can be borne with serenity when we walk with God. And the most lavish multiplication of them avails not when he withdraws. Only after God, therefore, let us pant. Let all desires be gathered into one. So beloved, as you and I are living here on this earth, 
the most precious pursuit of your life is seeking after him, is seeking after God himself. And that's what is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God all about? It's about the king, this glorious king who's the lover and the shepherd of your soul and my soul. When we seek after him, because he is drawing us to himself, as we yield to that drawing and as we cry out like the psalmist did, Lord, you said, seek my face. And I said to you, Lord, your face, O Lord, will I see. As we respond to that drawing, the work of sanctification happens by the Holy Spirit. You know, beloved, at, at the close of this, I want to introduce you to your theological thought called prevenient grace. In prevenient grace, we understand that the reason we ask God for more of him is because by his grace, he has been at work in us even before we were aware of it. It is prevenient grace, God's work previously, precedingly working in us and through us that caused us to come into the understanding that yes, God has poured out his grace upon our lives. Uh, by the gospel, by the work of his son on that cross. And therefore, grace effectually working in us causes us to ask for more grace. And we ask for more to see of his glory. And do we have an example of that in the Bible? And we have a beautiful example in Moses. And we see how Moses running away from probably uh, God himself, running away from the shame of what he did in Egypt when he murdered a man and running away from, uh, from uh, all that he had experienced and been through in Egypt, we see how God pursued him and God met him at the burning bush. And we see that God encountered him and sent him and released him into his call to deliver the people of Israel out of Egypt. And, and Moses saw God. He saw him at the burning bush and he saw his wonders in Egypt there. And possibly another person could have been satisfied with that and said, oh, I've seen God in the mountain. I've seen him in the burning bush. I've seen his glories and his wonders in, his, in, in, in Egypt to bring his people out. I've seen his wonder at the, at the crossing of the Red Sea when he parted it into two. And that's good. But no, Moses experiencing the effectual grace of God working in him, boldly would later ask for God. In the desert, one of the worst moments of his life, when the people of Israel were grumbling and murmuring and turning away from God, he steps out alone and cries out to God and says, God, if I have found grace, if I have found grace, prevenient grace, then Lord, show me your glory. I want more of your grace. I want your grace to enable me and position me that I would be able to see your glory. Beloved, if you're asking God for more of him, that is the evidence that you are deeply rooted in the gospel, causing the grace of God to effectually work in you. And that is why you will be sanctified. You will be made holy so that you would be able to be launched out further into the supreme joy of knowing him and loving him. And that is going to be the pursuit of my life, beloved. That is the pursuit of my life. I, I never knew what this year would, would lead me into, beloved. But even as I've gone through this, this unspeakable pain, there is only an unspeakable joy that will draw me out from the place where I am to a place where God will become my soul sufficiency. God will become my supreme joy. And even as I believe that one day I will see uh, my Farah again, but the greatest joy will be that I will see my Lord again. And the joy of this journey in, in this life, in this present age for me, the joy of this life, the supreme joy that will guard and guide my heart and my life, that will cause me to deny ungodliness and deny worldliness, that will empower me to live sensibly and righteously and godly. The joy is the joy of knowing him. 
and how he launches me and sustains me in this in this pursuit is by giving me this hunger and this thirst for him that will not be satisfied by anything else and by anybody else beloved i want to invite you to come and pray with me right now if you are not feeling thirsty for god you are not condemned but but i invite you to pray and ask god whether you're feeling it or not god make me hungry and make me thirsty for him i've been praying this prayer since the beginning of this year god make me hungry make me thirsty for you if i've been praying it since last year more and more than i've prayed before god make me hungry god make me thirsty for you and i don't feel i've yet reached that level of thirst that would cause me to just stumble over my life just stumble head over heels and go after god recklessly but that's the place i'm hoping that he will bring me to and i invite you to pray this for yourself if you're feeling that thirst in you that's an evidence that god is at work in you his grace is at work in you that you are deeply rooted in the gospel beloved let us hunger and thirst for him more than ever before let's pray together Father just thank you God for this word that you have enabled me to share with my brothers and sisters and firstly to myself and I pray right now in simple words Lord that you would cause the thirsting within us to just grow for you God right now by your spirit make me and my brothers and sisters more and more and more thirsty for you God that will cause us to just overcome our failures our weaknesses even even turn away from from ungodly distractions for things that are not of you to abhor those things you shun those things and to pursue with all our heart with all of our souls with all of our beings god oh god that you would be our supreme joy and that truly would be able to say like the psalmist lord my god you are my exceeding joy thank you god for i pray this that you would do this for us this very moment and it would increase every day god as we journey here on this earth thank you god that you have heard and you will answer our prayer by the power of your spirit in the name of our lord jesus amen and amen amen the lord bless you i've requested for a song to be played immediately after this word that would sum up uh, what i've shared with you Uh, Jesus is our all in all and may God truly cause your hunger and thirst to increase for him the lord bless you the lord bless your precious family and the lord bless you in this week and may you bring him increasingly glory and honor amen